So welcome back, everybody. This will be a session based on mutual learning, and we will try to understand how mutual learning happens among EU regions. We will also try to make sure that you don't get distracted and start looking at your phone. We will be paying attention to your body language and try and engage you. So my task here is to be a moderator, and I have to introduce the concept of transnational learning in a way that then will spur a debate that will be hopefully interesting for you. And we will hear from three exceptional mutual learning projects about their experience. So let's start. Why are we interested about mutual learning today? Because mutual learning is very much inside the concept of responsible research and innovation. You learn among stakeholders and you learn among partners. However, we want to be a bit more nuanced in the way we describe mutual learning. So I'm gonna talk about the good, the bad. Ooh, that's going too fast. Uh, I don't control that, is it moving by itself? I didn't touch it. Can I control it with that? Okay. We're gonna talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I'm gonna start by the good. The good is already in the world. Mutual learning, how beautiful. We learn, and we learn mutually from each other. We share. Wow, we are like still in that Erasmus spirit that I guess most of us were familiar with 20 years ago. And such beauty and um, positivity is really embedded in many of the mutual learning project's name. Terrifica, transform. <laughs> Sorry, not so much. <laughs> but also Smarty and New Renaissance, and that's what, um, that's what they transmit, the beauty of mutual learning. And that's the good. However, we also need to talk about the bad. And I think the bad is about how often mutual learning processes are conducted. I'm a fan of mutual learning, and I'm being a bit deliberately provocative. So, Mutual learning potentially could be a sort of theater in which you have a director that understands the plot, that understands the trade-offs among participants, and that constructs interactions in which such trade-offs and such conflicts are explored for the mutual benefit of learning, okay? However, what happens instead of, what happens sometimes, not often, but maybe a bit more often than I would like, that's my opinion, <laughs> is that instead of having a beautiful theater play with a plot and a director and clear roles and objectives, we have what uh, like, I can describe like a Sunday afternoon uh, TV show in which you just get people talking and actually their objective is just to talk and fill in the time because that what is they're there to do. So sometimes I think I found that in mutual learning setting there might be unclear objectives. They're not really well set, and there is limited attention to the interactive process. It's somehow expected that learning will happen automatically. And finally, um, there is often, in my experience of you know, maybe 15 years of mutual learning, that the, stakeholder, that the um, uh, stakeholders or the speakers are not uh, carefully chosen among those who are really interested in the process. And that turns out in like, you know, maybe excessively long presentations because no one really bothered to time themselves and, you know, all these things are um, slow moderation so you don't feel like, oh, I don't want to cut you, so, um, okay, one talks too much, one talks too little, and, and I think that detracts to the mutual learning process. And then I'm going to talk about the ugly. The ugly, for me, is the good practice at all costs. The good practice is actually like the um, holy rail of the mutual learning process. Most mutual learning process aim at sharing good practices, learning from good practices, and there are a lot of issues with that. First of all, you don't learn only from something that's good. In fact, you learn a lot from something that's bad if uh, you carefully explain and criticize what is not going well. Then the other thing is that uh, um, by applying a good practice, you're not necessarily doing anything good to your region, to your setting, if your setting is not ready to absorb that good practice. This, is a, this has got a complicated name, which is isomorphic mimicry. And then there's another like um, um, vice that comes out of this pressure to have a good practice, which is that 
to present a normal, usual, boring practice as if it is good. And this is done by overinflating certain aspects and maybe uh, not paying attention to certain other aspects. I think uh, mutual learning does not need to depend on good practices at all. It needs to depend on goodwill, on engagement, and on commitment from the participants. So today, we are going to learn from actually three uh, people deeply engaged in, uh, in, good in uh, mutual learning processes, Tatiana Fernandez from Siri, Marcia Mazzonetto from Transform, and Tania Adnagjejovic. And you will correct, uh, you will say your name correctly, your surname correctly when it's your turn to speak. And they will tell us critically about their experience. So we will have them in a panel, and then we will uh, focus largely on the good, but maybe let's just keep also that, uh, that attention to other aspects. And uh, before and after that we hear from them, we want to hear from you. We had originally planned a Slido, but we think it's better to have you talk out loud. I will repeat what you say for the purpose of it being recorded, okay? So our first question is, what do you understand by mutual learning in EU projects? And we ask you to describe it in just three words. And if no one raises their hands, I will find volunteers. <laughs> um, you, is that? <laughs> Um, okay, I'll give you five seconds <laughs> to think. No volunteers, no three keywords? Okay. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll start with friends. Elvira. <laughs> three keywords. Interaction, another friend. Sergio, <laughs> eh? Commitment. commitment, another word, um, values. values, someone else? Trust. Trust, very good. Without mask, please, just the word. Inspiration, inspiration. and testing. So testing, inspiration, trust, values, commitment, creativity. creativity. Understanding, please. Honesty. Uh, uh, you see, flexibility. flexibility. Very good. Listening, Listening. important. Openness. What? Open-mindedness. Open Connectedness. Reflection. Reflection. Diana, it looks like you're about to say something, but, <laughs> but you're not. <laughs> Interdependency. Okay. Anyone else wants to say? Language. Language. Another aspect. Common interest. Common interest. Fundamental. Any more? Okay. Now we can start with the panel. Our first point is just to have you a short description, uh, have, you, have you tell us a short description of your project and your, uh, uh, well, and yourself within it. And we, we have a slide, which I think should come now. Can we move to, to the presentation number two? Okay. Uh... I am Tatiana. I am I'm representative from the Serri projects. I work at the Catalan government, working in the administration for more than 20 years. But I also have an academic background, and that is probably what I am looking always for questions and for answers that help us to be more transformative. And in the last years, I have found that the European projects are a good place in order to ask questions and to find some new answers that allow you to do different things. So, as Elisabeth said, when we talk about transnational learning or mutual learning in transnational projects, we automatically think of exchange of good practices and meetings with, with other territories, with universities, explaining how good we are doing, in doing the things that we are doing. Uh, but in Serbia, I think we, we achieve changing that. And the starting point has not been regional good practices, but it has been a common approach that was described in the initial proposal of the project. 
And then from this starting uh, common ground, we started a process of building okay. the Tatiana, second coach. I think uh, they're not listening. They are not listening? Okay. So it was not the focus on not, was not on the exchange of good practices, but on starting from a common approach in order to build a more responsible and sustainable ecosystem and bring territories and universities together in order to find our own way, which has been the SERI process. In this uh, picture, uh, we have this image that describes the SERI transnational learning process. In the basis, we have the SERI learning and sharing space in which this knowledge conversion, this knowledge creation has taken place. And this nice picture is done by, by Mario, and it has been inspired in the in the image done by Mariusen and Virkala. Mariusen, you are here also, is our expert in international learning. And in the, at the beginning of the project, we all, had, we, we all came with our territorial perspectives and we were focused on our experiences and we're, we were looking for things from other regions that we could apply in our regions. And we, we, we were not coming forward. But with the discussions, we change our mind, and I think later we can continue on, on this. I can explain a little bit later. Thank you very much, uh, Tatiana. We now move to Marcia from the Transform Project, so we need the next slide. Coming. Yes, hello. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elisabetta. So, um, as you probably heard uh, yesterday from uh, my colleague Angela Simone, uh, in Transform we are actually working uh, with three regional clusters. Uh, what is a cluster? Basically, is a group of partners uh, within the same region. is typically composed of a regional government, uh, civil society organization, and uh, universities or any other institution that play a key role uh, in territorial development. Uh, what is really interesting about Transform is that each cluster uh, is actually um, using a completely different methodology. So we all have very uh, basic common objectives that are of course in line uh, with what we have been discussing in these two days. Uh, but then uh, we had uh, long discussions when we were setting up Transform uh, and we decided that it was absolutely important uh, to make the activities very tailored and specific to each region. It would make no sense uh, to actually just go and say, okay, we need to all do and adopt the same approach. Um, so we have uh, the Lombardy region that is actually focusing on uh, research agenda setting. Uh, in Brussels, which is where I'm based, um, uh, we are looking into social innovation and in Catalonia, um, Tatiana and, and, uh, and the rest of the team uh, are actually focusing on citizen science. Um, so basically, uh, this is already in itself a key point of mutual learning. Um, seeing how each region is achieving similar objectives by using a different type of citizen engagement is really key uh, to learning uh, from each other. Um, and then another really interesting point is that we have a, a partner also in the US, which is the Museum of Science in Boston. Um, the Museum of Science in Boston, they are actually leading a very interesting project called uh, Co-Creation in Public Engagement with Science. Uh, this project started one year earlier than Transform. Um, and it's really ambitious. It's uh, being financed by the National Science Foundation. Um, I was lucky enough to be, I'm, I'm still lucky enough to be part of their uh, advisory team. Um, and uh, they really engaged uh, a few uh, cities in the US uh, into co-creation processes um, where they did not even have a topic uh, to start with. So everything was completely bottom up. Um, and this really inspired us, especially because they had been already advancing um, in, uh, in what they were doing. They had one year of activities when Transform started. So we thought it, be, it could be very valuable to have 
uh, exchanges with them. Uh, so as you can see, I will be going in more details uh, later on, but as you can see, there is a lot of mutual learning happening in Transform at different levels. Thank you, Marcia. Tania, we need to move to the last presentation. Okay, thank you. I'm Tania Adnajevic. It's difficult to pronounce even in Serbian, so uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And at the beginning, I would like to introduce myself a bit uh, in order to make a parallel with the project. I am by education biologist with a PhD in genetics and working at the Institute for Biological Research, but mostly working in science communication and non-formal education in Center for the Promotion of Science in Serbia. So a terrific project that I'm coordinating in the Belgrade pilot region is actually overlap of those two my sites. I'm uh, lucky enough to work with the issues of dealing with climate change from bi my biological side, but also I'm lucky enough to engage as much citizens as possible and in trying to overlap that gap between the science and society. So Terrifica project is something that I was introduced to two years ago. Actually, I wasn't a part of the preparation project but it kind of gets stuck to me, and I kind of lo love working with it. It's a great team. It's a great uh, consortium of partners lead, uh, led by uh, Villa Bon, Science Shop, shop from Bon, and uh, gathered a lot of partners, very uh, diverse, from universities to civil societies, governmental institutions, even one high school. So it's kind of... Uh, actually a reflection of the acronym Territorial RRI Fostering Innovative Climate Action. We are uh, focusing on territorial issues here uh, because climate change is global but we are trying to tackle it from the territorial side. And as both, uh, both previous projects we are also uh, trying to incorporate bottom-up climate actions in order to uh, tackle this climate, uh, global climate challenges. Uh, what we are trying to do and reach by the end of the project is influence climate change mitigation and adaptation policies and foster co-creation as a methodology in, in, in overcoming these issues. Uh, I listed objectives here uh, that are focused, that we are focused on, and uh, actually the ones that I want to uh, point is citizens, engagement of citizens uh, in this whole process and I'd like to call you to visit poster that is downstairs. It's dedicated to involvement of citizens in the, uh, in the crowd mapping tool campaign in the Terrifica project. Uh, but also I want to present uh, what I have learned mostly by mutual learning uh, during this uh, piloting uh, and leading the pilot region activities in Belgrade in order to test, develop and evaluate action plans that are going to be implemented in Belgrade, but also uh, make a good practice in, uh, in order to be implemented somewhere else with the simil similar uh, climate issues. Each region, actually we have six pilot regions. Has may, I, sorry, may I say yes. that's for the next uh, question? Oh, okay. Yeah? <laughs> okay, so we have time, we have a set of questions, all right? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Tanya, for this introduction. Our next question is, what were the most important lessons from the project regarding mutual learning? Yes, Tatiana first, yeah. Okay. So, uh, I think during the project, the SERI territories have worked together, as I say before, with the SERI experts to adapt this initial common approach and this methodology that we had written in the proposal. And we have worked to adapt this methodology to the characteristics, to the dilemmas, to the needs of the local territory, no? At the beginning of the project, uh, we were always focusing on the differences. We were, we were always looking for similarities, but we were only seeing differences. Because experts wanted the three territories to be on the same page, and this was like an impossible mission, and then we were only focusing on the differences. And we really understood that we needed to change the focus, and the relevant thing for learning and for moving forward was to understand how the three territories were applying to their own territory this common approach. Because the local culture, the characteristics, their needs, at the initial moment we thought they were very different. But the, 
the interesting thing is what, that at the end of the project, we are seeing that the three territories are very similar, have similar challenges, and have similar ways of addressing these challenges. No? And this means that there are some universal things, that, some things that are universal to other territories. And it's very important that these European projects and this mutual learning process focus on finding these universal things. And for example, the four dimensions of RRI and how we integrate this for RRI dimensions into smart specialization strategies, it's a thing that it's universal and identical need for all territories wanted to address the sustainable development goals more effectively. So that's the most important lessons. Thank you very much. Uh, Marcia? Yes, thank you. And I can relate uh, very much with uh, what uh, Tatiana just said. Um, in our case, it was also uh, quite similar in the sense that um, one of the key points that we addressed from the start of the project, we, we have what we call mutual learning sessions every three months, more or less. Um, and uh, I think it was really nice because we were very honest with each other. Uh, one of the first questions we asked each other were, do we all have uh, a common understanding of what RRI is uh, and what does it mean uh, to, to promote it uh, within territorial development? Uh, having partners on board with you in projects such uh, transform or all the other projects we represent here doesn't mean automatically that we all uh, are sort of soldiers of RRI and that we can go forward uh, and achieve the objectives. We really need to take time uh, to um, build this, uh, this, this uh, mutual understanding. Uh, I remember asking each other, have we, has any one of us been uh, fully involved uh, in an RRI experience, whether it's related to citizen engagement, which is of course the key uh, within Transform or any other uh, of the pillars uh, of RRI. And many of us said, well, yes, I have experienced these, maybe related to gender, maybe related to open access, but none of us ha has been in a really full uh, RRI experience, let's say, like this. Uh, so we really took time to uh, discuss this together. Uh, and we decided to set up capacity building sessions. So, so there was this huge need that emerged uh, to share examples, concrete examples. Yes, but what does it mean? Where, where will it lead me to? So this is something we are doing. Uh, there was also a, a big need to um, better understand each other which within the consortium. So as I said, we are a mix of uh, civil society organizations, companies, uh, universities, uh, and regional governments. So uh, many of us said, researchers, for example, were saying yes, but on the side of the governments, they, they want us to um, uh, do more RRI, but then they really don't understand what are their needs, our needs. So, and the same thing came from the regional government saying, uh, yes, but there is absolutely no understanding of how we work. So that's also something that we are spending a lot of time on uh, in really trying to understand, um, yeah, what does it mean within these different contexts uh, to uh, support uh, and set up uh, citizen engagement processes. And if I can take just one more minute. Sure, um, yeah, I, I, there is one nice story I would like to share in terms of uh, mutual learning, uh, because I think uh, one of the really nice aspects of Transform is that it's also, uh, there is also mutual learning story there between two continents, in the sense that uh, the, the project that I mentioned that is uh, being led by Boston uh, was actually inspired by Europe. So in a sense, uh, I don't know if some of you remember, uh, in 2013, the European Commission funded um, a big initiative called Voices, which was a huge uh, consul citizen consultation uh, to, about waste management um, that led to uh, defining research priorities in waste management based on ideas coming from the citizens. It's, it really paved the way uh, to, to RRI in the New Horizon 2020 program. Um, and one of the person that is nowadays leading this uh, co-creation in public engagement project financed by the National Science Foundation 
was there. I was, I was lucky enough to lead that project and he was so inspired by what we did in Europe uh, that he um, really fought to try and do something similar in the US. So it, it, it took him years, but he managed to get this project funded by the National Science Foundation. So I think we have a nice success story there of uh, Europe actually um, yeah, having a strong impact also uh, in the US uh, on this. And that's why for us it was really important to also have uh, Boston involved uh, and keep learning from each other uh, also in Transform. Thank you very much, Marcia. Tania. Yes, uh, well, in Terrifica, I have to emphasize the territorial aspect uh, again, because it's a consortium consisting of departments coming from all over Europe, Western part, Eastern part, EU, non-EU. So that is actually the greatest uh, point to address while uh, having the, this mutual learning lessons. We set up something called help desk. It, it is based on the mu uh, mutual learning uh, methodology and it actually uh, got us to better understand each other and uh, better understand our cultural differences and address them in order to address this bigger issues and policies and action plans that we want to uh, make ourselves and, and try to, to, to adapt it to the whole region and the whole, whole pilots. So it's actually a, a kind of a more also bottom-up approach in order to change and uh, educate each partner, each person uh, in the consortium in order to actually uh, build up the things and tasks that we are meant to be, uh, meant to be done in, in the project itself. So it's a kind of a that is the biggest issue for me, but I think we, we, we will tackle some more information later. You, you can have more time. It's a, oh, okay, it's a, something that we, uh, from the start, it actually started as uh, we, we are all addressing same climate issues, or even though it's the different regions, different climate regions, but we are addressing the same uh, actions. For example, in Poznan and Belgrade, we uh, both meant to address water and water quality and air quality. But at the end, it turns out that uh, even though it's the same climate issue, we are uh, together with the citizens, we are developing totally different actions plans and totally adapted uh, to local environments, local policies, uh, local people and culture actually because it, that was the biggest issue how to engage citizens and how to make them involved and contribute to the whole co-creation process that we want to it and that is actually the the mutual learning part where we from the western part actually learn how to attract and how to engage citizens in order to uh, to uh, respond even more and with, with quality and with greater enthusiasm. Thank you very much. We can move forward to the next questions. What have been the main difficulties and obstacles regarding mutual learning and the main achievement? Okay. Uh, so, as I said before, the main challenge for us has been to change the focus from our differences each territory explaining and focusing on their needs or expectations of how they are different from other territories, to move from that towards our common challenges and the shared interest. So to discover that has been a long process. Because at the end, all territories, all European territories face very similar challenges, as I say. Yesterday, I talked about uh, two main challenges of smart specialization strategies, one which was transformative challenge, and the other was the stakeholders' participation challenge. But another similar challenge has been the integration of the four ERI dimensions into smart specialization strategy, and as Marcia also said, the capacity building challenge. This is a very big challenge, and I would add capacity building to navigate complexity, because uh, how to navigate complexity is the most important thing in common by all territories, but for all researchers, for all policy makers. And this is like the elephant in the room, because in all projects we are avoiding talking about how difficult it is to navigate complexity, because we feel that we lost control on the results that the European Commission maybe is expecting us to show. 
And then we need to accept that reality is complex, that working together in many different territories with researchers is very complex, that no one of us has the answers, and that we, all of us are going to be transformed. In, if the mutual learning process really takes place, all of us at the end of the project will be also transformed. Because, and maybe not everybody will feel comfortable because every person came to the project with their own ideas and their own answers. And at the end, your expectations were not the ones you expected. So we need to learn with that and to accept that this is the nature of the mutual learning process. Because if we are feeling comfortable all the time, is that we are not learning anything. So this would be my answer. Thank you very much, uh, Tatiana. Marcia, you can go. <laughs> now, again, I can very much relate uh, with what Tatiana just said. In our case, also, uh, of course, it's, um, it's quite challenging because each cluster is working on different topics, different methodological approaches. So we really need to um, constantly explain each other what we are doing. Of course, the, the bottom line um, is always citizen engagement, but still uh, we have a huge variety of, of topics and approaches. Um, so what we are doing, for example, to give you a concrete example, um, again, as Tatiana said, we, we, we are really trying to focus on common challenges. Um, to give you an example, uh, a, a common challenge that uh, emerged uh, from discussions we had was um, the difficulty of showing the added value of what we are doing. Uh, so again, all the partners involved, uh, including the regional governments, uh, told us yes, but I mean, if we are here, if we are in this project, it's because we believe that this is important, uh, but we also need to make changes, build uh, something that will make it last. Um, um, yeah, um, the, the person in, in I, I'm in, actually in Brussels, I just realized I didn't introduce myself, but I'm actually leading the Brussels cluster, uh, and the person from the regional government involved uh, told me, yes, I might change jobs, so if I'm not there anymore, if I don't manage to convince uh, the whole uh, ecosystem around me, then um, this will stop. Um, so this is a common challenge we're working on, uh, but each of us uh, in a slightly different way, because of, of course for each region, uh, finding a way to show the added value of doing things uh, slightly differently uh, means different things. So we have decided to have two levels at which we work on this challenge. So a, a general one, of course, we have also partner who is specialized in uh, impact assessment and helping us with this. But then we also have a local level where we work with regional stakeholders who can help us make it meaningful uh, to the region. Tanya, please. Well, uh, I see that we all have similar children illnesses. Uh, actually, what I wanted to refer is the what we like to call the evolution of each project. So uh, uh, the biggest challenges were at the beginning of the project, and I think it's a similar situation in each, not just Horizon or any European, but any project at all. Uh, while you are writing the proposal, there is this leader and they're just contributing, but when you have to make work and when you have to start the action, it's that it gets a bit serious and people get, uh, there is some part of mutual misunderstanding. So actually the, the greatest challenge was to, at the beginning, was to make this mutual understanding. What are we doing? Who is doing what? How are we going to do it? Are we going to do it all together? Or, or we are going to delegate work? But I think that that is actually, that's why I call it the evolution of each project. At the beginning, the, the, there is this fuss and confusion at the, at always. But uh, when we set that thing out, and we are now the great team, but we have this uh, next level, it's the un uh, misunderstanding with the stakeholders. So it's kind of like a co-creation. Uh, at the pan uh, keynote speak, uh, the lady uh, referred to co-design, but we are making to a new level, co-creation. So it's qu quite difficult 
to explain to all stakeholders that we want to attract what the co-creation is and why are we investigating and researching, is it valuable enough as the methodology in order to con con connect it to the climate change or any other issue. So uh, that's why we are targeting citizens, because citizens are the ones with the fresh insight. They are not colored with bureaucracy, with the policies, with the Brussels language. So it's kind of a new influx of the information and the insights, uh, how we're going to address different uh, questions. And, and the one thing that uh, I also wanted to refer that is actually from the uh, Elisabetta's uh, introduction, that is transcription of good practice. Uh, what is good practice in one country, in one pilot, doesn't necessarily have to mean that it, it is a good practice. It, from our experience, it needs a lot of adaptation and a lot of modification for local environment and local stakeholders in order to make the most of it. So that's, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, the question contained a part about challenges, obstacles, but also about achievement. And I think you will largely cover the first half. So another round with the main achievements. <laughs> I think the main achievements have been the results of the project because during the whole project, it was complicated. We all have very different views and there were so lively discussions. And at the end, there are still these discussions. I think probably when you ask each individual person, they won't be happy with the results of the project because they don't see their own expectations or their own knowledge on this, but this is the nature of co-creative processes, no? And the nice thing also, if you recognize the results as your own, then there has not process of mutual learning or of co-creation taking place. So it's not perfect, the results, sure, is not perfect, but it's a co-creation process and it's a good result in order and the question we should ask ourselves is, did we transform our, did the process transform ourselves? Are we seeing things or approaching things in different ways than before? I don't know, maybe we can ask the questions to the other partners from Siri because there are many of them here. In my case, it has been so. I think that is the main achievement. Yeah, that's a big achievement. Uh, Marcia? Um, yes, um, so in, in our case, Transform, I think, has started so, uh, in, in, later than, than the other two projects, so we are a little bit uh, more than halfway into the project, but I think we already have some really great achievements uh, also in terms of mutual learning. Uh, to me, one of the nicest one is that uh, by now, uh, all the partners involved in the project have been able to do activities that involve citizens. So we have all run uh, citizen engagement activities already. Um, and you can really see um, the excitement that uh, this uh, uh, creates into, so what was at first maybe a bit of fear uh, and not really knowing what would be coming out of it uh, has turned into um, this uh, really nice feeling of um, wow, well, this is really interesting and, and, and can really change things. Uh, so what we are sharing now is this feeling of um, empowerment, I would say. So all the partners now start feeling like, yeah, that's something we can do and we can do it really well and it can have uh, a nice impact. And we can clearly see, especially in terms of the regional government involved in the project, that. Uh, something is evolving, so they're really thinking about how to do it more, uh, how to um, make, it, make this happen also beyond the, the Transform project, uh, but also how to embed it in the future. So I think this is, um, and sharing of course, sharing about this is, is really great. So uh, for, I think this is the main one for us. Thank you very much. And Tania? Oh, yes. Be, besides recognition of the project's results, I have to uh, be much, uh, a bit subjective and to brag about the recognition of project itself because the Terrifica was named and recognized as a good project in the last Green Deal call. So it's kind of a, you know, it's, it builds you up uh, this self confidence if a uh, project that is ongoing is actually recognized as a good one, as a good approach and good methodology in. Uh, in 
dealing with the climate issues. But what I wanted to emphasize is actually uh, achievement in my institution, and that is why I, I'm just naming it, uh, but I can name it for the other partners, it is the actually uh, we never was in, we were never involved in any citizen science project uh, before Trevifica. And now it, it was a good solid base and starting from Terrifica uh, and at the end of Terrifica as an extension of Terrifica actually, uh, we are recognized as the institution in Serbia who will make a public call for new citizen science projects. So we are kind of a hub for the new citizen science project in future in Serbia, and that is recognized in strategy for the science for 2030. So it's uh, it's really huge achievement from one institution, uh, and how to deal with uh, influences and the mutual learning and new experiences and how to incorporate it in order to, to extend the, the life of the project itself. Thank you very much. The, ne the next question is about COVID and uh, how it affected your mutual learning process. So I have to say that we were lucky in Serri that we started the project before the, the COVID, so we had time to meet each other, to discuss, to understand our differences, and also to build complic complicities. And this made it easier to navigate these COVID times. I, if I compare with Transform, this is the other project, so <laughs> this was the occasion when we first met with partners from Transform in the Serri conference. It has been more difficult because these complexities didn't exist there. So I would say that for Siri, the fact that we met all of us in different places, different times, and we knew each other, make it not so difficult to to survive this COVID. It was not the same because you miss the dinners and the dis lovely discussions. When you have differences, when you discuss with a glass of wine or in front of a good meal or on the beach, it's easier <laughs> than discussing things in Zoom or in Teams, no? But somehow we survive. <laughs> and maybe the good thing is, yeah, sometimes in these projects we must travel so much with so many projects <laughs> at the end. <laughs> then it's good to have a combination of the two worlds, no? Some team meetings and some presential meetings, so. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marta, Marcia. Um, yes, so for Transform, unfortunately, it was a bit different. We have never, ever met in person. So when Transform started, it was just a couple of months before the pandemic crisis uh, started. So basically, we did not manage to even have our kickoff meeting, so uh, you can imagine how emotional it was to actually <laughs> see Tatiana and other partners for the first time um, yesterday. Um, so this of course uh, meant that, and even at the regional level, uh, I haven't seen uh, my regional partners in Brussels in person uh, since uh, the pan pandemic crisis started. So basically uh, this is uh, of course making it quite difficult uh, at many levels, uh, in particular in terms of mutual learning, um, but also in terms of citizen engagement activities. So all the citizen engagement activities we have done uh, have been online, except for Catalonia, I think you have managed, and I see Diana nodding, uh, to do at least some some face-to-face -face activities. But I think another key point is also that uh, what happened is also that uh, region, regions all of the sudden uh, started having other priorities. Uh, of course, the, 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 the crisis had a really strong impact uh, on uh, budget cuts, but also uh, ambitious projects, I'm thinking of the Brussels region, uh, ambitious uh, pro um, projects that the, the region had in terms of citizen engagement had to be uh, quite downsized. Uh, because, of course, uh, the focus was on something else. Uh, so I think we can be really proud of what we have managed to do uh, despite uh, yeah, the, the madness of uh, the last couple of years. Thank you very much. Tania? Well, unfortunately, I do not have the, that much to add. <laughs> they covered the whole thing. There is this difference that uh, we have a lot of uh, German partners, so we miss beer a lot. So we organize uh, virtual beer sessions, but that is not not, not, not that good as alive. But uh, yes, it's the similar situation. The COVID actually influenced us all in a similar way. We 
did had uh, online sessions and on online work before the pandemics, but you know we were always eager to meet and interact, and it kind of uh, even those uh, co-creation workshops. Even though you have all those tools available online and all this methodology, and now we are also well experienced in implementing that, it's just not that as meeting in person. And uh, I hope this Siri conference will be the new start. <laughs> Thank you. And now the last question before we move to the public. How has the mutual learning process impacted on your understanding of the issues you deal with. So we're not talking about the process, it's like what have you practically learned? How is your view uh, on the topics you're addressing uh, changed? Our work, for example, si. how it changed our work. Okay. So uh, in my case, Siri was the first experience with European projects. So I have to say that I have learned a lot with partners and from partners and uh, working and learning with others and from others in these lively discussions when there was not COVID, but also during the COVID times, uh, has of course changed my professional lives of how I work in my job. No? Because our approaches or our actions are very much conditioned by, what, by our experience or by, by what we know, and especially in public administrations, it's very difficult to change things Inertia is very present, it's very, we always keep to, the, to do things that, as always, because we don't ask if they are having impact or not, it's just the way to do things, so we just do that with inertia. And working with European projects um, and collaborating with many different people, also from other administrations, uh, allows you to see the old problems with a different perspective and to see that it's an option to not to change anything and to continue with inertia. It's not like our destiny, but it's a choice we make. So, and this is a very important lesson. And to participate in this kind of project has allowed me to, to contemplate new possibilities and also to introduce change in, the, in my work, in my everyday work. Thank you very much, Tatiana. Marcia. Yes. Oops. <laughs> um, yes, so um, on a personal level, uh, I would say that uh, it has allowed me to have a much better understanding of how a regional ecosystem works. Um, so again, relating to what Tatiana said, of course, there are these two elements that there is, uh, of course, a, an option to let this inertia go, so not, not change things. But even when you have individuals very motivated to change, uh, there is a whole um, spider net of relationships that you need to be aware of that I have been learning. And I think we have all been learning very much by working at regional level. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm again talking about Brussels because uh, it's the cluster that I'm leading. Um, having, so the, 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 the institution that is involved in transforming our case is the actually the, the, the regional agency supporting financing research and innovation. Um, and them being motivated to engage into uh, citizen participation uh, can lead to other agencies, other local agencies being uh, maybe not so happy because that's what they think that is their uh, thing to do, or uh, maybe universities uh, being uh, a bit worried about the reputation that this might generate within their local environment. So, uh, to me, I think a big lesson was uh, about how delicate you have to be when you go into these kind of processes. It's really uh, every step you take, uh, you really need to take into account so many connections, so, so many things, so, so many feelings that sometimes you, you don't even think of. Uh, and it's really easy to um, maybe do things without even knowing uh, that might piss someone off. So uh, this is really important. I think uh, it's something that I, I definitely will uh, take with me from, from Transform. Thank you very much, Marcia and Tanya. 
As I, at the beginning, I said that I come from the natural sciences. So actually, the biggest impact was on my professional uh, work is that it uh, opened those horizons, those rigid natural science scientific methodology horizons, and incorporate the open science and the RRI and the engagement of citizens into my everyday work as a both researcher and as a science communicator. So I'm, I'm uh, while we are joking, they're calling me spokesman for citizen science. So, and as a spokesman, uh, spokesman I spoke, spokes lady, is that correctly? Uh, uh, I'm trying to attract uh, and, try, uh, and empower citizens to contribute to science, but also empower citizen, uh, citizen, scientists and researchers to develop uh, research ideas and research pro projects that are actually having the citizen science part incorporated in it. So that's why I'm doing in my genetic research, and I'm hopefully will uh, make aware a lot of uh, different scientists to, to try to do it and uh, not to, to have the traditional answers, all citizens can just gather data. No, they don't. They, they can contribute to each part of the process and they are very valuable stakeholders and be always aware of that. So. Thank you very much, uh, Tanya. Thank you very much, Marcia and Tatiana for an interesting discussion. I want to open now the floor uh, to the public. There are two options. Either you ask a question, we have time for the speakers to answer, or the alternative is that you tell us about what is uh, your experience of participating in mutual learning processes and how they have affected you. So if you raise your hand, you can do either or both. Please. Well, we need a mic. We need a mic. The mic is coming. I'm, I'm from Serbia and I'm interested in the Transform project and it's a bit technical question but I think it's important. You have a US partner from Boston, so what, what was their role? What was the NSF? I, I, I'm, I'm really what, was, what was the role of the US partner? How was it organized as I assume they did not get funded through the Horizon project and how was it linked to the NSF project? How it worked online with citizen science project across continents? Yeah. Uh, what was the name of the project, the NSF project? To learn. Yeah, no, no, you're right. So uh, the partner in Boston um, is involved, but they don't have a, a, a budget on the project because, as we know, there are no agreements with the U.S. Uh, but so we establish a sort of agreement uh, of collaboration. Um, they don't need the budget to be involved because their project is financed by the National Science Foundation, so that was really good. But what we did was uh, we planned, uh, well, we had planned um, a lot of mutual learning opportunities, especially in terms of traveling uh, and being able to take part, so for us to take part in their citizen engagement activities and for them to come and take part into our citizen engagement activities, which of course was completely canceled by <laughs> what happened. Uh, one of the first thing we were supposed to do last uh, April was to go to um, this uh, incredible uh, session they had organized, they called them Forum, uh, that's the methodological approach they use, uh, where they would have had uh, at least 1,000 citizens uh, involved in uh, one of the final steps uh, of the work they are doing on uh, co-creation there. Uh, and what is really interesting is that, as I mentioned, they did not have a topic to start with. So the topic, they, they are focusing on social housing, which is not, um, which is a topic that has been agreed with the citizens who are engaged. Uh, so it was not really, the idea was not really that they would, uh, for example, be involved in, in the citizen science project that uh, Catalonia is setting up. It was really more, again, about learning from each other from the methodological approaches that we are adopting for the citizen engagement. Um, and also to see uh, to be inspired by a city, by so the, the uh, policymaker partner uh, uh, is the city of Boston. So that would have been really amazing to see how the city of Boston is going to take up the 
what is coming out from this co-creation process. Uh, everything is on hold. Uh, it was really interesting because um, we kind of learned from them. They, they were really obliged very fast to shift to online. So we had quite a lot of sessions, Zoom sessions, where we were exchanging with each other and honestly telling, they were telling us, don't do that, doesn't work. We did that, it was a catastrophe. But then, um, yeah, they have managed to advance a little bit. Uh, but we are hoping next year that we will be able to, to, to catch up with the uh, yeah, with this uh, mutual learning uh, exchange. Thank you very much, Marcia. We have uh, very few minutes left, so we would really like to hear your experiences uh, of mutual learning. Hello, I'm Nina from Montenegro, but I would rather make a question because I, I'm curious for all the participants. Uh, whether from your project uh, derive some kind of permanent infrastructure for continuous co-creation or the story ends with the project itself. Okay, I go first. Yes, that's the idea. So again, um, in Transform, uh, we still have more than one, one year ahead of us, but for each uh, region, the idea is to have a, a permanent uh, impact. Uh, so, for example, in the case of Brussels, uh, what we are doing is uh, we are working with the, the regional agency supporting research and innovation um, to um, show them how uh, they can uh, integrate uh, aspects of citizen engagement and other aspects of RRI uh, in their research calls. So right now, for example, we have a, a call uh, open uh, that is a, a very experimental one uh, where we are actually um, providing support to research and innovation projects uh, to uh, go into, engage into uh, citizen participation. Uh, if this works, uh, the, 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 the agency is uh, committed to make it happen again in the future. So if, if, that, uh, if that happens, of course, it would be uh, an amazing outcome. And I think Angela can tell more, but also for the Lombardy region, um, there are several citizen engagement uh, processes which uh, the region is committing to keep doing, so keep going in that direction, even beyond the duration of, of transform. So the idea is really to have concrete changes uh, what the Commission likes to, change, to call institutional changes by, uh, by the end of uh, transform that will continue uh, beyond the project. And I think, Tatiana, you, you probably also have examples from, yeah. for Catalonia. As a representative of the regional government, I cannot imagine participating in a project, in an European project, if I am not looking for a transformation in my territory. So it doesn't make sense that governments or administrations participate in projects only just to, to travel around Europe and to have different ideas, but the real objective has to be that it's useful, that you think that it's useful to transform your territory. In the case of Siri, it has been very relevant to rethink our smart specialization strategy, but also to rethink the way we, how government can collaborate in different ways with universities and also with municipalities in order to build more responsible, sustainable research and ecosystems. That means that the researchers work with society and for society. And in the case of Transform, we see that citizen science is a very useful instrument. It's, more, it's not an objective, but it's an instrument to have an impact on public policies, to improve public policies, because we are always talking about how we should engage citizens in public policies. This is not easy, and it's not only about asking uh, where do you want that we spend our budget, or what, do, what ideas do you have for the region or for the, the city. This is not the way to make participatory process. But citizen science, with not the focus on science, but on making policies more transformative in order to be more effective to address the sustainable development goals, I think citizen science is a very powerful instrument 
and this relation between citizen science and policy should be more explored, and in the case of Transform, it gives us the opportunity to work with experts in citizen science and with experts from public administrations and to, to experiment different methodologies in order that we can be more effective with engaging citizens in our policy processes. Infrastructure, we don't need infrastructure. What kind of infrastructure? Of course, but we have this usually. So, it's, uh, in a region, usually there are platforms, they are spaces where you meet together. We don't need to build the new places, but in, the, in this case, the, this, the these European projects. Or some kind of legal framework that makes no, it obligatory. It's not necessary. Mm. Yeah. Also, for us, really, the aim is not to add new things, but really go where. The, the, the research and innovation are being funded and where the policies are being defined and sneak in transform, there, that. Exactly, transform that so that you don't need to build additional things you, 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 it's a way of embedding within what exists and there are so again a very quick example the, the Brussels region has a call for projects, research projects that is called co-create so there is, let's say, an infrastructure. infrastructure okay, yeah. it's a bubble. That's the only place where citizen engagement happens. The whole rest of research and innovation, so that's like this, and the whole reason and innovation uh, and policy making is like this. That's the bubble. Where I want to go with Transform is not that bubble, because that's where it's already happening. I want to go everywhere else. and make it so that the, the Brussels region sees that there is an added value in doing this, so in having this co-create, uh, co-creation aspects, also everywhere else. So I, I don't actually, sometimes having a specific infrastructure, I'm not saying it's worse, it's, it's fantastic that it has it. You know why? Because I work as a leading, uh, I worked as a leading expert for Montenegrin Smart Specialization Strategy and we were the first country outside of the Europe that succeeded to pro promulgate that strategy and get the positive response from the GRC. But one of the directly GRC requests was to... We can, we can talk maybe after. Okay. okay. Was to provide permanent infrastructure for continuous CDP that actually is co-creation underlined. And that's why I was, I was really curious about okay. other European experiences. Okay, thank you very much. You can uh, continue the discussion in the next break. And we have another question from back there, and it's gonna be, I think, the last question, because it's uh, 12.43. Uh, it was not, do you hear me, yes? Yes, now it's working, yes. No, it, it was not a question, it was, it was a comment on... It was more a comment on, on, on multi-level learning. And, and my, my first comment was that it, of course, needs a methodology and to perhaps act on that. But we're not hearing you very well, actually. It, it needs a methodology so you can, can abstract and, and, and you, you can understand the context. Is. And that, that was, I was leading according to a project called Lars, and we could do some learning within the consortium of smart specialization. It was in the Baltic Sea. And that was thanks to that we had a well-established methodology in the project so you could, could understand it, it very well. And the, the biggest challenge is, of course, to, to, to understand the context in, in where the other persons work. Uh, I've been involved also, for instance, in national accounting. We had a project for statistics Sweden between, between Bolivia and the context is, is that you, you have to understand the context of the Bolivian statistics in the Swedish things. For instance, if you, if you bring a person with an with, with, uh, empl employment statistician, he has to understand that there is no un unemployment in Bolivia, but people, people may have, have work that is of very bad quality. And uh, that's my third comment would be that it, it's very important that you have an organizational backup that you had the motivation. And, and I think uh, 
that is, is, that is the key, because if you don't have the full organizational backup, uh, I was working in, for instance, in Oman a long time ago, and the key for the success of, of that project, in, also in national account, was that the ministry was really interested in, in, in improving the national accounts. And I think that is this, the, the key for the, for the projects and for this to, to succeed is, is that you have very, very strong organizational backup and also a very strong methodology on, on how you work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that was the alarm that marked at the end of the session. <laughs> um, so uh, please join me in applauding our panel. Thank you for your participation and attention. <laughs>